Charles Darwin turned our world upside down. His theory of evolution by natural selection is one of the most profound and far-reaching ideas in human history. It's also, alas, one of the most controversial. Science now has the evidence that proves evolution is true. Yet today, incredibly, the opposition to Darwin is more fiercely vocal than ever, denying plain facts in more and more elaborate ways. You haven't seen it, and I haven't seen it, so please stop calling it science. If we have gone from slime to human beings, there should be an overwhelming amount of evidence. You are a teacher of science, and you think that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. Yes, I do. In this program, the increasingly aggressive backlash... Right now, your destiny is all f***ed up, king atheist. The battles that I think really matter... We can't get into the business of knocking down kids' religions and, and the religions of families. Why, why not, actually? Why, why not? Because... Why not? Be and how the first man to understand evolution himself wrestled with religious faith. For Darwin, the problem was close to home. His beloved wife was a devout Christian. Today we have public battles as we confront the ranks of religious fundamentalists eager to attack Darwin's great legacy, which they just don't understand. When I was a young boy, I looked to God to explain life. And then I was introduced to Darwin and evolution by my father. At first, I didn't get it. It didn't seem possible to me that something so simple could explain so much. But then I learned about it a bit more, I thought about it a bit more, and then suddenly the penny dropped. I really got it. This incredibly simple theory really was capable of explaining everything about life, the beauty, the complexity, the diversity. And then I thought, well, if science can explain something so apparently inexplicable as life, who knows what the limits might be on what science could explain more generally, without any recourse to the supernatural. At that moment, I became an atheist, and I've never looked back. Charles Darwin, too, changed his mind about this biggest of questions. As a young man, during his voyage on the Beagle, Darwin still believed that God had created the world and everything in it. But then he came across more and more evidence that showed that life must have evolved. Fossil ancestors, patterns of anatomical resemblance, startling similarities in embryos, and the power of domestic breeding all showed that life forms had changed over time. Darwin believed there was an entirely natural explanation. All animals vary, and in the competition of nature, some variations are more successful and more likely to reproduce than others, passing their variation on. Here in his study at Down House, Darwin grasped that the religious story of creation ran against the evidence of the natural world. With evolution, God just wasn't part of the picture. But there was a problem for Darwin. His wife, Emma, was religious, and the trouble began soon after they got married in 1839. Emma wrote him a letter describing her deep faith. But Darwin was no longer convinced there was a god. He agonized over the letter and scribbled on it. When I am dead, know that many times I have kissed and cried over this. Darwin never criticized religion directly in public. I think he didn't want to hurt his wife's feelings. Instead, he let his science do the talking. He predicted that science would bring about a gradual illumination of minds. Yet, sadly today, it seems harder and harder for people to see the light.
Here, in the 21st century, people are retreating from reason, trying to turn back the clock to a world before Darwin. You see, Genesis chapter 1 says everything that God made was very, and none of you think kill or be killed, survival of the fittest, nature red and tooth and claw is good. Is the world really 6,000 years old? Do you realise up till Noah's day, people lived to be nearly a thousand? You don't die because you get old, you die because you're a sinner. Up till Noah's day, there's no record of rain. The Australian John Mackay is a celebrity among evangelical Christians. He's a creationist. He believes in the literal truth of the Bible's creation story, and he attacks evolution on the very crudest level. Now, I didn't grow up brainwashed with this. It's the result of finishing my university course, listening to students say, if evolution is true, why can't we see it happening? Third year genetics question to the professor. Right. You take and, that question seriously, do you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and the professor, his answer I took even more seriously when he said, well, it happened so slowly you wouldn't expect to see it happening, and all of a sudden right. I thought, hang on. And that's true. Good. So, in other words, what you don't see happening is not science. It's unobservable, and you were the first person you're to using admit the on word PBS. C. You're, looking the <laughs> you're using the word C as meaning C within one lifetime. If a phenomenon takes millions of years, of course you're not going to see it. Which means you have a faith position, it does not and you need to admit it, it means you have to you use other there. evidence than the, than the evidence of one man's eyes. It means you have oh, to look... Oh, sorry, Darwin was only 1859. That's only 150 years ago almost, right? And you haven't seen it, and I haven't seen it, so please stop calling it science. And call what you're teaching philosophy or atheism, if you're going to really be honest, and my time is up. That's ridiculous, but anyway, thank Good. you very much. Thank Bye. you. The refusal to believe in anything you can't see yourself is absurd. Think about it. I never saw Napoleon with my own eyes, but that doesn't mean Napoleon didn't exist. John Mackay can't see a cell or an atom or weather systems on the other side of the world. Does that mean they don't exist? Darwin didn't just trust his own eyes. He checked his theory against evidence gathered through extensive correspondence with naturalists across the world. Mackay, it seems to me, misunderstands science at a deep level. Science is precisely not limited by what we can see with our own eyes in one lifetime. The whole wonderful endeavour of science is to investigate phenomena beyond human experience, from far-off galaxies to microscopic bacteria. Creationism's next best strategy is not flat denial, but to claim there is evidence against evolution and that a genuine debate is yet to be had. This is the creationist's favourite claim in America, where the battle between faith and science really rages. Charles Darwin's struggle with religion was private. Today, the battle has become public. In my lifetime, opposition to evolution has grown, particularly in the United States. Fifty years ago, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, and the space race began. In response, the Americans made science priority number one. The government poured money into science education. For the first time, evolution was taught in every classroom in America. But the religious fundamentalists hit back. Tell me, Joe, how does he explain away God? What? Why don't you come to the science club meeting? Let him tell you. To defend their Bible against the biologists, they developed creation science, a bizarre fusion of scientific language and religious doctrine that they touted as a real alternative to evolution. Our eyes are amazing little instruments. But you know, they're only one part of the wondrous body that God has given us. Our 
I worry that this is brainwashing, not science. And I felt compelled to take a stand. Audio floor. My book, The God Delusion, has put me firmly in the front line in the battle between religion and reason. Can I sign in, Richard Dawkins? Hello. Hello. I'm one of your biggest fans. Can I speak to the number one British intellectual? I've read all your books. Have you? That's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Can I touch the hem of your gown? <laughs> The most powerful nation on earth is polarized. At this conference of atheists, I'm treated almost like a rock star. But there are sections of American society that would happily lynch me. Can you, are, you, are you religious at all? I mean, do you no, pray? Not. You're not. You're not religious at all. Do I look religious? I hope you die slowly and you f***ing burn in hell, you damned blasphemy. And you should realize that your entire life has been a delusion and that right now your destiny is all f***ed up, atheist. Go f*** yourself. You, sir, are an absolute ass. Your feigned intelligence is nothing more than the fart of God. You suck. Go burn in hell. Satan will enjoy torturing you. Christian living for God. There is a God. Her created all of us. The only one who is blinded are the unsaved and stubborn. Everything Darwin said is wrong and evolution has never been proven and nothing is evolving now. The Bible is the best book. <gasps> nothing even comes close to its accuracy and if you think God's judgment is bad, the devil has worse in store for all unbelievers. No punctuation at all in that one. Doesn't scare me. I mean, I, I rather pity these people. They react in a way that sounds defensive and actually really rather pathetic. Ha-ha, you f***ing dumbass. I hope you get hit by a church van tonight and you die slowly. <laughs> but there's also an entirely different kind of opposition, slick in style and with a more polished line of attack. Wendy Wright, is president of Concerned Women for America. Wendy Wright. Yeah. She represents half a million evangelical women concerned about issues ranging from lesbians on TV to poor old Darwin. Hello, I'm here to see Wendy Wright. OK, great, I'll take you right in. Thank you very much. I worry that her organisation would condemn American children to ignorance by attacking sound scientific evidence. Why is it so important to you that people not believe in a creator? No, no, that's not the point. I mean, the, the, the point is that as a scientist, I'm concerned that children in American schools and in schools elsewhere should be exposed to the evidence and allowed to make up their minds about the evidence. And we completely agree. In fact, that's why the, the, the challenge in America, whenever this debate comes up, uh, is teach the controversy, teach the evidence. Because as it is now, in many cases, school children are only being taught about evolution. They're not being taught about the frauds in evolution and the, the uh, lack of evidence in evolution. So it's actually us who are arguing for teaching all the evidence, not just the ones that are favorable to evolutionists. Well, you could say which controversy. I mean, Teach the controversy. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? And it would be if it was a controversy between equally valid points of view but it isn't. I doubt if Wendy Wright would teach the controversy about the Earth being flat because the evidence for the Earth being a sphere is so massive. There's also massive evidence in favour of evolution, but she doesn't seem to want to know about it. Oh, really? And actually, yeah. you're, you're, the way you have framed this and your very close-mindedness mm -hmm. uh, really is a very good example of the kind of uh, censorship we see within the scientific yes. community yes. that won't even allow discussion about the controversy. That if evolution had occurred, then surely, whether it's going from birds to mammals or, or even beyond that, surely there'd be at least one yes, a evidence. a massive amount of evidence. I'm sorry, but you people keep repeating that like a kind of mantra because you, you just listen to each other. I mean, if only you would just open your eyes and look show at the Show it evidence. to me. Show me the, well, show me the bones. Show me the carcass. Show me the evidence of uh, the in-between stage from one species to another. Go and look at some, uh, some modern paleontology labs. Go and talk to some modern paleontologists. Just, just look at that evidence. It's beautiful. The evidence for the, the transition between the reptilian jaw 
and the mammalian jaw. The reptilian jaw has several bones. The mammalian lower jaw has only one bone. And the other bones that were in the reptile have now moved into the inner ear. It's a beautiful transition. There are so many beautiful stories. I mean, you'd be fascinated. So, is there evidence for evolution or isn't there? Let me show you. I'll begin with fossils. There are now literally millions of fossils in museums all over the world. They've been dated and documented and the relationships between them analysed. When mapped out through time, the anatomical connections can only be explained by evolution. All life is related in a vast family tree. Fossils also show how life forms change over time along individual branches of the tree. Look at these skulls. The so-called missing links show the growth of our ancestors' brains over the last three million years, as we evolved from something like a chimp on hind legs to modern humans. But there's even more convincing evidence. There is a code of four chemicals in every cell of every living thing, DNA. Today, machines like these can analyze and compare DNA with absolute precision. So Darwin's theory can be tested. Is it true? Yes. The results match the fossils. DNA links all life through the code, and the more closely related two species are physically, the more similar their code. This is just part of the mountain of evidence that supports evolution. Some religious people just don't know enough about it, but some do, and their strategy is even more bizarre. They see God's infallible hand in everything. Well, the evidence that we have is the same for both of us, but whereas you might see fossils as evidence for evolution, I might well say this is evidence for a worldwide flood. Would you want someone like this teaching your children science in Britain in 2008? This is Nick Cowan, chemistry teacher at a well-respected Northern Grammar School. And he uses American creationist material in his general studies class. But you know it's not just fossils, don't you? The molecules of DNA, the molecules of protein that you look when you look at a mole and a rat and a kangaroo and a human and a monkey, they're all hard molecules that you can see just as you can in your chemistry teaching, and they fall on a perfect family tree. It all fits, it's so elegant, and you as a scientist would appreciate it if only you could remove your blinkers and look at it as a scientist should. How old do you think the world is, by the way? Uh, I don't have a... Uh, if I said uh, l less than 6,000 years, you probably feel this man is crazy. But I've had a look at this. I don't know. The dating methods we have are flawed in their methodology. You are a teacher of science in a, in a major British school, and you think that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. Yes, I do. I would rather believe God, who was there, who's told us, <laughs> than scientists who are fallible, who don't know the past, who weren't there. And again, all I'm doing is... This is a classic old chestnut. God is infallible, therefore the Bible is right. It's as if I claimed Darwin was infallible, so what he said was always right. Luckily, scientists don't work that way. We sustain our ideas not through sacred texts, but through reason and evidence. And again, all I'm doing is bringing healthy debate into the science lesson. We have about a dozen different radioactive clocks, and they all point to roughly the same answer, which is that the world is uh, between four and five billion years old. And when you say God told us, you're talking about a particular document for which there is no particular historical authenticity, and you're putting that above the whole of science, and you are a science teacher. If there is a God, his word must be more important than the, the work of fallible human scientists. I'm all in favour of teaching children to think for themselves and to question for themselves. That's, that's great. But there are limits to that. And I think that when the evidence is so massive, it, you owe it to the children to teach them what the evidence is. What creationists like Nick Cowan claim is God's perfect creation 
is in fact the result of evolution's arms race. Animals have evolved extraordinary adaptations to fit their environment, but they're not perfect. Designers can go back to the drawing board. Evolution is condemned to modify what's already there. So nature is full of compromises and imperfections. Creationists also ask how something so apparently perfect as the eye just sprang into existence. Well, it didn't. The basic chemistry that makes up a light-sensitive cell is shared right across the animal kingdom, and natural selection has seized on this time and time again. Science has uncovered species at every stage in the evolution of the eye. It is a cumulative process, and each step of the way is more useful than the one before. The eye has evolved independently at least 40 different times around the animal kingdom, and it has evolved gradually, improvement on improvement. And yet... No sensible person would have ever left the body the way it is. Like what? What's a good example of that? Um, the most dramatic is, is the human eye. Right. You know, it's held up as this example of perfection in the body. It's not perfect to guys. It's a perfect example of, of why the body is not designed. Cover one, if you would, please. And we take the pin and we move it right in the, and you have to keep looking right at right. the bridge of my nose, so okay. keep your eye fixed. And now we're going to move it just out a little bit, about 15 degrees, and right about there. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. You can't see it? No. Now can you see it? Yes. Now can you see it? Yes. Now can you see it? No. There's a blind spot. Yeah. That's really lousy. Our bodies are so fabulous in some respects. Our heart keeps beating and never takes a five minute vacation for decade after decade after decade. That's astounding. But we have an appendix, we have wisdom teeth, birth is difficult, uh, many people get nearsightedness. And the combination of some things being so perfect and other things being such botched jobs is what should make us all sit up and take notice that this is something that's been shaped by natural selection. It has a lot of vulnerabilities built in that can be explained only by how natural selection works. So our botched, compromised bodies are themselves evidence of evolution. They're shot through with history. Evolution is a fact. It's documented by science to the same degree Napoleon is by history. Some things are just true. They're not a matter of choice or opinion. But you'd never guess that in the place where this matters more than anywhere, in our schools, where the teaching of evolution has become a hugely sensitive issue for science teachers. This is multicultural Britain, and one of its fault lines runs straight through our children's classrooms. How do we reconcile scientific truth with the deeply held convictions that bind religious communities. Charles Darwin was the first person to grasp the extraordinary idea that life on Earth had evolved without the intervention of any god. And I've always been intrigued by how he himself wrestled with what that meant for religion. Darwin was deeply worried about how religion spread, not through reason and evidence, but by being seeded in children's minds at a young age at school. He wrote that it would become as difficult for them to throw off their belief in God as for a monkey to throw off its instinctive fear and hatred of a snake. Darwin became concerned by what he saw as the stupid classical education at rugby school dulling his eldest son William's once lively mind. So he was prepared to brave the snobbery of Victorian society to send his four other sons to the less prestigious Clapham Grammar School because it had strong science education. 150 years later, Darwin would find reason to be equally anxious about what his children were being taught at school. The compromised values of multicultural Britain mean that teachers hesitate to offend the religious beliefs of their pupils, even when these directly contradict scientific fact.
Earlier in the series, I took a science class from Park High School in North London, fossil hunting. I was amazed by their lack of knowledge and understanding of evolution. So, what do their science teachers have to say about this? I worry they're tiptoeing too respectfully around traditional beliefs. Some kids just won't accept it. Um, you know, that they're brought up in families where um, they just don't believe it, and that's, that's an end to it. There's no lack of understanding of it necessarily. It's just, it, it, you know, we can't get into the business of knocking down kids' religions and, and the religions of families. Why, why not, actually? Why, why not? Because, why not? Be <laughs> because, we, because we teach science, yeah. and I would not feel comfortable talking about anything but science. So if I present the scientific case and I make sure they understand the scientific case, I think I've done my job. Yeah. But their acceptance of it is a separate issue. For some students, truth isn't something they see coming through science, even though our emphasis is on ideas and evidence to, to support these ideas. Um, a lot of students have a, a religious narrative that's very important to them. It's an important part of their life um, through their... Would it be too unfair to suggest that these well-meaning teachers are running scared? Who could blame them? Obviously, what we believe is affected by our upbringing. But that doesn't mean we can't change our minds. We all have the right to see the evidence and re-evaluate our beliefs. These science teachers shouldn't be afraid to spell out the scientific truth derived from evidence. I don't see that we can, we can expect to to convince them just by showing them the evidence. Really? Um, Why not? Well, because they've got other evidence which they've been brought up with throughout their lives. But that's to, not evidence. No, to them it's evidence, though, isn't it? Yeah. And, to, and, yeah? to their, and to their parents. We're talking about something very fundamental here. We're talking about young people. We're talking about identity. It's not our place to... to um, to fly the banner of science and say there's no room for anything else. All we can do is present science. This is a way of thinking. This is, this is, science has given us so much. Um, this is one way of interpreting life. Um, we Just believe one this way is, of interpreting. We believe this is the way because we are scientists, but it's not my place to tell you that you're wrong. We, we, we believe it because we're scientists. Do you really mean that? Or do you mean we believe it because the evidence is there in the world? Well, rocks, that, that's what I'm saying. That's yes, what, because yeah. I'm, a, I'm a scientist and that's the way I view no, no, the world. No, it's not because you're a scientist, is it? I mean, it's there. The evidence is there. Their, their evidence is not there. It's just made up. You don't believe that the Earth is round only if you're an astronaut. You don't believe Napoleon existed only if you're a historian. You believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. Evolution is also a demonstrated fact. The truth really is out there. It's not a matter of opinion. Relativism the quaint notion that there are many truths, all equally deserving of respect, even if they contradict each other, is rife today. It sounds like a respectful gesture towards multiculturalism. Actually, it's a pretentious cop-out. There really is something special about scientific evidence. Science works, planes fly, magic carpets and broomsticks don't. Gravity is not a version of the truth, it is the truth. Anybody who doubts it is invited to jump out of a tenth floor window. Evolution, too, is reality. You don't decide whether to believe it or not believe it on the basis of whim or culture. The evidence supports it. Evolution is the plain truth. Where has all this wobbling come from? Well, it started right back in the 19th century, in Darwin's time. Rather than just denying the evidence, the Church of England developed the most sophisticated strategy to face the challenge of evolution. It saw evolution as one truth within a bigger one and embraced Darwin in what one might call a comfortable relativist fudge. Science would explain the workings of nature and God could take the credit for getting science started in the first place. It's a subtle argument put forward by the most powerful Christians in the world. Let's take it on in its modern guise. Darwinism as a theory of how evolution works, a highly plausible, highly credible theory about <clears throat> biological history. I don't have a problem with that. Do you see God as having any role in the evolutionary process? 
For me, God is, is the power or the intelligence that shapes the whole of that process. Um, as creator, God's act is the beginning of all creation. So by setting up the laws of physics in the first place, in which context evolution takes place? Things unfold within that. What about intervening during the course of evolution? I find that that rather suggests that God couldn't have made a very good job of making the laws of yes. physics in the first place if he constantly needs to be adjusting the, uh, adjusting the system, adjusting the works. And I think that's a slightly different question. But there's a problem for the Church of England. Isn't it trying to have its cake and eat it too? But trying to have both God and the laws of science means that one or the other is compromised. Either God can't interfere and has no impact, or if he does get involved, it can't be squared with science. Um, you do believe in some of the New Testament miracles, I mean, such as the, the virgin birth and, and any, any others, I mean, the, the raising of Lazarus. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Now, isn't there a kind of mismatch between your, your view of science as something that God doesn't interfere in and that um, somehow he made it right the, in the first place? How do you reconcile that with what looked to some of us like sort of more like cheap conjuring tricks and, and not the sort of grand um, creator that, 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 mm. that you've been portraying. I think if you start with a picture of you know, God outside messing around with the works, you are in danger of getting into the conjuring tricks model. I think though that um, there are certain moments when there is an opening in the world in which the underlying divine action comes through in a fresh way. Take the birth of Jesus. Here you have a long history of preparation for the coming of God in a new way. Here you have a particular life, that of Mary, opening itself up to the action of God in a certain way. And then something fresh happens, which is not, if you like, a suspension of the laws of nature, but nature itself opening up to its own depths. Something coming through enough. I'm not sure what that means. I, it sounds to me <laughs> awfully like suspending. <laughs> It's poetic language, it's, it's I know. It's poetic yes. language. Um, and I realise that it, yeah. <clears throat> you know, there are ways of talking about that which do simply sound like God interrupting things. I mean, I, of course, love poetic language, but th mm. there does come a time when you worry that people are going to misunderstand it as... Or that it's a, a way of wriggling out of hard questions. <laughs> well, um, mm. I mean, it, it's one thing to say, uh, in some poetic way, it was mm. sort of right that Jesus mm. should have been born of a virgin, mm. but when you say, I actually believe it mm. happened, that's a statement of fact. That's a statement of scientific fact. Mm. It, it, it happened. Yeah. Um, it's true or not, yes. It's true or not, and I don't think you can really wriggle out of that by doing some poetry, but well, no, much I... as I love poetry. On the one hand, I've got a lot of sympathy with the decent, middle-of-the-road, moderate Christians. On the other hand, I sort of feel that the decent, middle-of-the-road Christians are tying themselves in knots, trying to have it both ways, trying to have both God and Darwin. And in a sense, they're opening the door, letting in the rabid creationists by making it respectable to believe things on the basis of faith rather than evidence. So, deny, attack, absorb. Now we've gone through the range of strategies by which religion tries to deal with Darwin. I think they all flounder. But even I can see why religion puts up this resistance. I get letters from readers who have understood the truth of evolution, but somehow wish they hadn't. Darwinism can be unsettling, even frightening. Darwin himself was shocked by what he called the low and horridly cruel behaviour he observed in nature. And yet it was integral to natural selection. One piece of research shook Darwin to his core. He knew how some insects, like this parasitic wasp, lay eggs in the larvae of other insects so that their young, when hatched, can feed on them. They also sting each part of the prey's nervous system so as to paralyze it, but not kill it, to keep the meat fresh. So the victim may be aware of being slowly eaten away from inside, but unable to move a muscle to do anything about it. How do we face this deeply disturbing truth, duck under a security blanket of faith in God? But then, Darwin wondered, what kind of God would create an animal that can only exist in this horrible way? Isn't it better to embrace reality, bleak as it sometimes may be, than to avoid it and live a lie? 
In the teeth of life's hardships, Darwin was determined to live authentically. He hadn't just observed suffering as a scientist, he experienced it himself in his own life. Darwin had always had a particularly strong bond with his eldest daughter, Annie. He was charmed by her make-believe worlds and her neat little scrapbooks, while she liked to smooth his hair and pat his clothes into shape. But at just ten years old, she suffered a painful, lingering death following a bout of scarlet fever. Darwin was devastated. We have lost the joy of the household and the solace of our old age. His devout wife, Emma, told the other children that Annie had gone to heaven. For Emma, suffering helped to exalt our minds and to look forward with hope to a future state. Darwin, by contrast, could find no meaning or religious consolation as he faced the desperation of bereavement. After the initial period of mourning, he and Emma scarcely spoke of Annie, but they never forgot her. Religion became a source of tension between them. Finally, I think the tension had to spill out. In his 60s, Darwin wrote an autobiography in which he revealed his anger at what he called the manifestly false Bible story. And he added, I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished. And this is a damnable doctrine. Though his autobiography was written for his family, Darwin must have known it would be published after his death. And he grasped the opportunity to finally say in public what he had long struggled with in private. But if Darwinism demolishes the religious delusion, what can go in its place? How did Darwin himself find consolation in a godless universe? Religious people attack Darwin for, in their view, draining some of the wonder out of our world, for the bleakness of his vision of nature. The playwright George Bernard Shaw really hated Darwinism. He said, when its whole significance dawns on you, your heart sinks into a heap of sand within you. There is a hideous fatalism about it, a ghastly and damnable reduction of beauty and intelligence, of strength and purpose, of honor and aspiration. There's no doubt that people do find a Darwinian view of life bleak and unsympathetic, but it's still true and we can't get away from that. And further, in any case, there is a sort of happiness, there's a sort of bliss in understanding the elegance with which the world's put together. And Darwinian natural selection is a supremely elegant idea. It really does make everything fall into place and make sense. And I find great consolation, great happiness in that level of understanding. Just ponder for a moment Darwin's central idea, the tree of all life, now verified as fact by our decoded DNA. It means we are related to every living thing on the planet. And what's more, we are descended from ancestors who were winners, adapting in any way possible to survive and pass on their genes. You and I and every living creature can make the following proud claim. Not a single one of my ancestors died young. Not a single one of my ancestors failed to copulate. Plenty of other individuals died young and failed to copulate, but they didn't become ancestors. It's blindingly obvious, but from it much follows. It means that every single living creature has inherited the genes of an unbroken line of successful ancestors. We have all of us inherited what it takes to survive and reproduce. That's why we're so good at what we do, why fish are so good at swimming, why birds are so good at flying, why aardvarks are so good at digging, 
why humans are so good at thinking. That, in essence, is Darwinism. Darwin had to bury two more of his children in his lifetime. Another daughter and a son died in early infancy. In memory of Mary Eleanor and Charles Waring, children of Charles Darwin. Darwin confronted grief in his own way. He found solace, I think, in the very earth in which he had to bury his children. For his last book, he turned to earthworms. Darwin was fascinated by how little by little, over huge lengths of time, their slow turning of the soil churned the whole surface of the earth. Nature's plows had their own extraordinary underground economy, a damp, dark, life and death struggle to which we humans were totally oblivious. I doubt, Darwin wrote, whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world. So Darwin didn't wallow in man-made notions of the supernatural or an afterlife. His down-to-earth wonder at nature was his cure for loss of faith. I'm going to visit someone with a similar outlook, the philosopher Dan Dennett. I've known him for 25 years. We're the same age, but I think of him as a kind of intellectual elder brother. But recently, he had a brush with mortality. There was a terrible crisis with, with his heart, and his friends were all told that he was going to die. It was a very scary moment. Afterwards, when he was recovering in hospital, he made the point that many of his friends had said that they prayed for him. And he thanked them, but then added, and did you also sacrifice a goat? Dan has no shred of faith in God or eternity. Does he think his Darwinism would deny people comfort? I think it only undermines a, a, a crutch that, that they don't need, and that's the crutch of an absolute immortal soul. That's an idea that a lot of people think is very important. Uh, and what it does, of course, is it replaces it with the idea of a material, mortal soul. Yeah, we have souls but they're made of neurons. And the little neurons individually are just blind little bio-robots. They don't know, they don't care, they're just doing their jobs. The amazing thing is that if you put enough of them together in the right sort of teams, you have basically a soul. You have the, the control system and the memory of a being that can be held responsible, that can hold himself or herself responsible, that can look into the future. And when people say, well, where do you get your consolation yeah, yeah. from. I sort of feel, well, how much more do you want? What? Indeed. What could be more wonderful than being part of this in amazing living tapestry of, of growth and, and exploration and innovation, uh, all happening in, in not a million, not a billion, but in a trillion places at once. Uh, the the just to look just at our planet, the exuberance of the l life processes going on around us and all of the creativity that is there uh, is, is just stunning. It's, it's great to wake up in the morning and realize that you're a part and, of this. And not only are we a part of it, but we can reflect on the fact that our ability to realize that, our ability to understand it and to exult in it, is itself the product of the same process. Our brains yeah, that are yeah. so, so capable of, yeah, of appreciating yeah. this have been produced by the very same process yeah. that we are now appreciating. Yeah. Sometimes I like to say, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the planet has, has grown a nervous system and it's yes. us. Charles Darwin died in 1882. 
I'm not in the least afraid to die, he whispered to his wife Emma in his last days. Darwin had wanted to be buried in Down, next to his two dead children. In the event, however, the scientific establishment insisted on the accolade of burial in Westminster Abbey. A host of scientists, philosophers and celebrities attended on the day. In true C of E style, the church attempted to absorb the man who had brought down the house. Yet even so, the Archbishop of Canterbury turned out to be indisposed, and the God-fearing Prime Minister, William Gladstone, pleaded prior engagements. Perhaps not for them the funeral of the scientist whose work, more than any other, has proved the biblical creation story shallow and wanting. I revere Charles Darwin. He made sense of life. The world is amazing, even more amazing than Darwin knew. And the more we discover, the more petty our little private beliefs seem. Does Darwinism leave a gaping hole where religion once was? No, rather it opens our minds to a world of majesty, the real magic all around us. Not based on uncertain faith, but sound science. In this handful of soil, there are about 25 billion bacteria. That's four times the entire human population of the planet. We humans and the animals we can actually see are a tiny fraction of life on Earth. In the perspective of the universe, the vastness of the universe and of geological time, we are insignificant. Some people find that thought disturbing, even frightening. Like Darwin, I find the reality thrilling. The complete series of The Genius of Charles Darwin is available to buy on DVD, as well as the Richard Dawkins collection. Order your copy now at channel4.com slash shop. Cleaning up Castleford next, though, Kevin MacLeod and the Big Town Plan.